Hello and welcome to another modeling video. This is Alan from the Makana Man at YouTube with a, another honing your airbrush skills video. Um, we're not going to be doing too much uh, this session. I do have a few extra uh, painting tips and demonstrations that are as always going to be a lot of fun. As always we're going to be painting our lines once we do a bit of cleaning and I think what we're going to do today is just a recap of uh, everything we've learnt about maintaining and cleaning airbrushes even though we've done a recap a few times and most of the information is repetitively repeated it's not that my opinion of the um, viewers, my uh, colleagues is um, uh, stupid or me talking in an overtone or lecturing um, in the end the series is more about uh, my learning and uh, what I'm picking up and learning and experimenting and how far I'm pushing um, the airbrush and I'm just inviting everyone along for the ride and see what lecture bits I learn everybody else can take on uh, as always um, this is not a tutorial uh, these are all experiments. I'm using a cheap airbrush. I've gotten very comfortable and knowledgeable about this airbrush. Things that I do to this airbrush may not be good to other ones. Uh, notably name brands such as Iwata, Pache, Airtech. Uh, things like your Sparmax, your cheaper Chinese um, knockoffs, your Mr. Hobbies, your Deltas, your uh, uh, the Tamiya stamped one, they're all very, very, very uh, similar. A lot of your commercial non-name brand um, airbrushes, anything that's a 0.3mm uh, with an adjustable uh, end and a very similar shape. These are all a very similar old-fashioned pattern type uh, airbrush. Um, this is the DH-103. Unfortunately, Sparmax does not manufacture this anymore. And they've got the Max-103 and the DH3, um, both a 0.3mm airbrush and uh, what I've done to this airbrush is very very successful and I've produced some uh, great work the only down put is is there is a rubber seal around here uh, that has died from constant uh, ultrasonic cleaning though with um, Vaseline lubrication it has not leaked and I've always uh, airbrushed below um, the 90 degree horizon so there's never been a chance for paint to backtrack backwards so today we're going to pull the airbrush apart I'm going to give it a clean I'm going to talk about tuning it uh, maintenance of the airbrush maintenance of the compressor and thinning paint going into the airbrush uh, the DH103 is or the Max 103 is the airbrush I will always recommend um, when purchasing an airbrush it is absolutely vitally important that parts is able to be sourced this is why I recommend all the ones that I've uh, mentioned you can buy on eBay under 0.3 millimeters uh, five nozzles or five needles for approximately uh, ten dollars uh, they're very slow shipping from Hong Kong, so you should really stock up on a good 20 or 30 and just sit on heaps for absolute ages. The problem with the more expensive ones is they might get a slight split, you might lose a nozzle, something might happen, and you can't do any more painting for a multiple period of time. Owning multiple airbrushes is not a bad idea, and uh, we're going to pull it apart. So the first thing you should always do when you newly own an airbrush is know how it comes apart and how it goes back together. So it's recommended to pull the airbrush apart um, about 20 times and just get used to pulling it apart and putting it back together, especially without the instructions. Uh, generally it can be a bit rough and tumble. There are two components that you need to be ever so delicate with and that is the needle which is uh, this one. You do not want to do anything to the tip that will bend it or do any damage. And the nozzle. If you do anything on that nozzle, it's a very, very, very fine piece. It will uh, split, crack, bend, whatever. These are the two most dan um, easily damaged pieces, but it's also the two most easily replaceable pieces. 
Airbrushes normally comes with a rear piece like this. I choose not to use mine. And it normally comes with a wrench. A big problem a lot of people have with the nozzle is they over tighten it when they put it back on and the thread stays inside the airbrush. Uh, when tightening it, you should only tighten it with one or two fingers and stop when there's uh, no more um, pressure. It does not have to be that tight. And with uh, the nozzles that I buy, they do not have a rubber washer. It's just pure metal thread. Uh, the more expensive ones do come with a tiny washer. I found buying the non-washer ones makes uh, absolutely no difference. So there is an element of uh, saving money. Now because I lubricate my airbrush, there's still uh, lube. It's really loose. Things are not tight. And uh, after a month use of this airbrush, it's still very, very comfortable to use. It's uh, very, very smooth in its uh, trigger operations. Um, even though you have to be very uh, careful with your needle, uh, don't be afraid to use the rear of the needle for the removal of parts. Now, the air solenoid, which is this component, can get clogged quite easily to unclog it um, after cleaning it pressing down on it multiple times can loosen the slightest amount of um, paint. Uh, it's ideal to lubricate it. Once lubricated it may have a little trouble air flowing through it. Uh, don't be worried as um, just constantly working it and constantly putting high air pressure uh, through it will um, open it up eventually and air will go through. And this is our airbrush completely pulled apart. I've uh, done that competently and very, very quickly. I'm going to put everything in the ultrasonic cleaner and let it soak for a few hours, let it vibrate. What an ultrasonic cleaner does is uh, vibrates the chamber inside about like a hundred times a second or 25 times a second and due to these uh, slight vibrations as there's a thinner inside attacking at the dry paint just loosens everything up the dry paint turns back into liquid and floats straight to the top before we do that normally just every day when you're operating an airbrush and you're putting paint especially um, primer through it and you got the nozzle out with the back of your airbrush. If you put the needle through, you'll see a large clump of crap coming out. And you can see this massive clump would so easily block a nozzle. This is the number one reason 99% of the time your airbrush gets clogged. Now there has been a request to demonstrate how to clean an airbrush without an ultrasonic cleaner. I've got a bottle brush coming in from eBay for about two, three dollars. It hasn't arrived yet, so it's going to have to be in the November video. Uh, I will demonstrate how to clean an airbrush um, that way. Very time consuming, but I think it's uh, very, very worthwhile. Uh, the thinner that I'm putting in here is lacquer thinner. Um, the only uh, washer that um, or rubber component that I'm really worried about damaging is uh, the one that's already damaged around here so paint can backtrack so when you're airbrushing you always airbrush down on a downwards angle never up because paint will just run straight down uh, you shouldn't even do that with your good airbrushes but um, it's just what's happened I've uh, lived with it and it doesn't seem to be a problem so there's no reason to replace it I've got all the parts in there we'll fill with lacquer thinner um, this we do not put in the ultrasonic cleaner and remembering when I was talking about um, spare parts I've stockpiled a ton of them and you can see that um, I'll go for a fair while every time I do replace uh, the needles and nozzles I do mention in the video which I did do this month I dropped uh, the airbrush at one of my model meetings this way and the needle was sticking out so when it fell and hit the gr concrete ground like that really really hard 
the needle and nozzle just popped out and it just forced the uh, needle right through the nozzle welding it together luckily it threaded itself but it threaded itself in the softer nozzle and the actual thread inside the airbrush just gently came out with a toothpick so I was able to use um, the needle and nozzle from a cheap Chinese knockoff airbrush and um, put it straight in here and it worked just as normal and later on I'm going to show um, a Macross model kit that I'm heavily weathering and two dioramas and I've uh, painted those with uh, the damaged airbrush replacement parts now with thinner that I buy I just buy a really big 4 litre basic lacquer thinner with uh, an easy pour container uh, this brand has been out of business for a long time so the new bottle I just empty into this bottle uh, keep out of reach children you don't want them drinking this stuff don't breathe it in wear a respirator don't let it touch your uh, hands and skin fill it up until it just barely submerges the main bottle body of your airbrush so we just need a little more and then we turn it on and watch the uh, water change colour I'm going to let that do this for about an hour or so as we are waiting for our airbrush to clean we'll talk about compressors and compressor maintenance when buying an airbrush rig I highly recommend that uh, the majority of your budget should be going into a decent compressor with uh, all of the following and your compressor should probably get just as much maintenance as your airbrush so if you've got $200 budget to buy an airbrush 180 of it should be spent on at least um, an eBay tank compressor with regulator and dial. So what you're going to need? Tank, the compressor or, or, um, of course, the dial to represent what PSI, the top knob is your regulator, bottom is the water trap and I always uh, splash out 20 bucks on a quarter inch to half inch um, tap I've got three way tap to add multiple airbrushes a single tap will do two taps are most ideal reason why is you can empty the air immediately you should never keep air in your compressor after you're done airbrushing always release it because you'll damage the seals in the cylinder uh, compressors because they compress air they also compress moisture and build up water uh, the tank will fill up water over time and will require to be emptied so you'll be collecting water in the little reservoir down there and um, all you have to do is open it and water will come out charge a little air through it, open it and blast what remnants of water is in there close one of those taps if you ever get any moisture in the hose you close the tap, build up air, open it and the hose will blast all the water out things that can go wrong if you don't um, maintain your compressor uh, parts can seize from rust so water always has to be removed and also as you're airbrushing um, it's going to splatter and do all sorts of terrible things even acrylic paints nothing likes to be mixed with water and it ruins uh, atomizing your um, paint, air and uh, the magic together in producing really thin lines and uh, brilliant paint schemes so always remember when you're maintaining your airbrush drain all the water out of your compressor should be a monthly thing and it has been demonstrated in previous videos Paint is very important in anonymization and we have three major types of paints that we always airbrush with. To the right is acrylic, Tamiya, uh, Gunzi is very popular. 
the manufacturers recommend uh, one part thinner to two parts paint you can add a tiny bit more always remember to stir your paint and use a little tray before adding straight into an airbrush if you add straight to the airbrush the thickest part of the paint coats the needle the thinnest sits on top and you don't actually thin what's on the very bottom uh, that or alternatively put your thinner in first then your paint then um, mix stir your paints use uh, X20A thinner or the correct form of uh, thinner for your um, paints using an eyedropper for cleaning after acrylic methylated spirits does an excellent job it's uh, pretty cheap you can buy in a two litre bottle for a few dollars over using this uh, very expensive small 10 100 ml bottle of uh, isopropic alcohol if you can source good isopropic alcohol that's ideal enamel slow drying same story um, you can mix anywhere from one part thinner to two part paint to about 50 50 and spray at a low PSI again um, the oils and uh, components of uh, enamel thinner can separate over time and it needs uh, a very thorough uh, stir and mix so remember to uh, mix it thoroughly add it to a tray add your thinner mix it again thoroughly and that could be a uh, spray to low PSI as well um, ideally you want it nice and thin you want to hold your airbrush away you want to dust on you don't want to just blast it on because that can be a bit tricky slowly build it up it is slow drying so it can take a bit of effort to figure it out lacquer is the easiest to um, airbrush and probably the cheapest to go about it with thinner uh, thinner is just lacquer thinner for cleaning and whatever four liters is about 20 to 30 bucks that will last you ages um, 50-50 mix, same story, uh, low PSI, low um, keep the airbrush away and dust on, it's the easiest to thin, it's the easiest to atomize, so if you're a beginner and you've got a mask and everything, you want to um, try using lacquers first if you have access to outdoors, if not things like your Tamiya acrylics would be the next best thing to start learning on, but it is a little trickier to atomize. Um, to note, your water based, your synthetic water based such as uh, Citadel, uh, Vallejo, Life Color are its own special mix of uh, water based. They don't thin that well with water, that's their problem. They come with their own in-house cleaner and um, thinner which has all these synthetic blends to them. Uh, you can't find an alternative to them so you need to use their cleaner, you need to use their thinner or otherwise it generally clogs and causes all sorts of problems in your airbrush. Uh, your airbrush can also not have trace chemicals of other chemicals when you're using things like uh, Vallejo and whatnot, or otherwise uh, that will clot as well. So it needs to be thoroughly flushed out with water and the in-house thinner, which can make it expensive. Some people have a lot of luck airbrushing with these. Some people just have a terrible time. So you're either in uh, one camp or you're in the other. It's not necessarily that this is a terrible brand of paint to use. It's just not for everyone, and you just got to have the correct know-how and tools and whatnot to go about your business using these paints. Uh, obviously, I don't. And here's all the pieces cleaned and nicely polished. I have swabbed the inside there and uh, the air hole with uh, a Q-tip, and you can see remnants of uh, gunk. I will be using a fresh Q-tip and petroleum um, lubricant or Vaseline to lubricate all the threads uh, this piece or these two pieces in particular which are revolved around the moving of the needle and the spring um, afterwards don't forget to actually clean the needle itself with a bit of thinner I forgot to do that but we'll do it before um, the airbrush goes on so a question a lot of people might be asking is why are we lubricating the airbrush? Does it affect my paint? No, it does not affect your paint. The reason why we lubricate our airbrush is it's like a car. Uh, metal on metal 
does not um, work well. It gets stuck if you get any sort of debris, paint, something that dries between the two metal, it will seize and get permanently stuck. And we've all um, experienced it where um, an airbrush just the trigger won't move backwards or forwards. It's because a tiny bit of paint got into the metal and it's welded shut. Um, why, what happens is when you've got the grease, the grease doesn't dry, it uh, plugs any holes where paint is likely to leak and it just keeps everything constantly uh, where it's lubricated so the metal can work up against each other with um, a lubricant barrier and uh, just constantly work even if there's a little paint. If a little paint mixes in with the lubricant it will just make the paint uh, constantly wet and the uh, lubricant will change colour. There's no um, there's no issue about that. So I've just put the T piece in and uh, the outer rim of that got uh, wiped up with uh, Vaseline so as well as the inner um, thread here I'm going to put in the uh, solenoid and that's uh, nicely uh, loose and free just put a little bit of um, Vaseline around that thread so we can pull it apart not too much because it will get clogged and that way the air wants to go through but it can't get past until the uh, button is pushed down and uh, using the back of the needle I'm going to push down on the T-piece and it is flowing beautifully I'm just going to put a little more Vaseline on top of it just so paint does not interfere and it's Vaseline because the washer around here is uh, near dead or non-existent we're just going to push a heap of Vaseline in there and the thread around here. Uh, the next piece we're going to assemble these mechanisms so this piece is constantly running on this piece and we have got uh, the spring uh, this bit your fingers will get a tad dirty but you know that is not a problem whatsoever at least I don't mind um, probably should wear gloves I don't know And that way, when this is moving backwards and forwards, if any paint gets through there, it will constantly flow freely. Uh, this bit's always a balancing act, um, getting the little tongue there. At first it's very fiddly, and you're going to drop it in there about a billion times and lose it and move it around. But after you've done it about half a dozen times, you would be able to... Uh, assemble an airbrush really really quickly uh, that thread probably should have uh, a bit of grease on it as well and then once you've assembled and disassembled an airbrush then you can be assembling it and disassembling it with uh, lubricants and all sorts of um, garbage actually quite hilarious as I was talking about assembling your airbrush very very quickly I stupidly have dropped the tongue inside the trigger but I fixed it no problems you lubricate the back here Now I'm going to go clean my hands and finished assembling. Now if you're doing all that to a name brand airbrush like your Iwatas, your Airtex, your Pache's, your whatnot, um, instead of using Vaseline, you'd probably just drip in um, a really uh, 
fluid air brush, um, oil, like uh, high velocity, something with uh, sewing machine oil, or anything in the bottle that sort of flows like water. And all you have to do is via an eye drop, just drop it on your um, threads and in the appropriate section. So lubricating a more expensive airbrush would uh, do it wonders as it's more tight fitting. Um, in theory, after every use or every day using your airbrush, just oil the rear half of your needle. And as we were talking earlier about the nozzle, as we're talking about the nozzle, when we got the wrench, only you only tighten with one or two fingers, like so. You do not too much torque on it because it's a very soft, very small amount of metal. It is uh, going to absolutely shred. And when you push the airbrush in and the needle sticks out, you don't want to force that. You only want to just um, push it ever so slightly because you'll tear through the material and it's going to shear the nozzle. And it's going to it's, it's it's going to be bad. You're going to um, have paint splattering all over the place. Free the needle backwards and forwards. Make sure it's nicely lubed. Tighten the bolt, and there we go. We have free, um, very smooth, almost like a brand new airbrush trigger going backwards. Uh, it pressures in, but it takes a while to release, only because there's a bit of lubricant. If you push down on it heaps, and we push um, a little air pressure in it, and constantly play off the trigger, it will uh, soften, and it'll be airbrushable. That's why we're going to spray some lines, just to allow uh, the lubricant to settle in, the paint to settle in, things to atomize correctly, and we shall do a test. But uh, yeah, more or less, um, again, explained through uh, many other videos, uh, tuning your airbrush, and I'm going to give it a quick um, polish with a little thinner, because there's oil all over it and in the cup. And we're ready to paint some lines. The air solenoid wasn't working, and I was talking about working it, so I've only got that on the air hose. And when I pushed it down, no air was coming out. So I worked it heaps. And I just kept pressing it, pressing it, pressing it. And now, air is coming out. I hope you all heard that. The trigger was also not exactly working. So again, and as I explained it in the video, when you pushed it down, there was no air uh, coming out. It's because it was uh, clogged with uh, the lubricant. And I just pushed up and down about a few dozen times. And now, air is coming out. I just spray some paint out to make sure if there's a tiny bit of lubricant and paint mixed together, we're getting that out. And that's why we're painting lines, just in case if there's any bad mixes, because when we do a good clean out, then it'll be clean. Now, going back to the bubble jet technique, we can see the paint inside of the cup. I put my finger over the nozzle, push down, and when I pull back, you can see bubbling. Allow that to happen for about 30 seconds. It's the air going, trying to escape through the nozzle. It can't. My finger's blocking it. So it's going backwards and it's escaping through the paint cup. And it does an excellent job of stirring the paint. And here we go. If we think back to our first video, um, there has been a humongous change. These lines are pretty thin. We'll have a look. And they're crispish. You get a bit fuzzy here and there. This is 
pretty much no splattering. The thicknesses are fairly consistent, getting in quite close, and I'm fitting more uh, lines on the page. The startings are um, still a bit funny. Some of them are still fat and splattery, but we're um, getting better. Uh, the first one's pretty terrible. But all in all, if I remember, I was only able to get like 12, 13 lines the first time I'd done it. And uh, now I'm getting every single one pretty clean without further tuning. I say this monthly practice and um, all this tuning every month is definitely having a massive impact in the improvements and finer um, application of uh, my airbrushing. I probably say this every single month. But out of all seriousness, um, just going through that motion, the, less, the list of things that I've mentioned in this video, every month or every couple of months for those who don't turn out as many models as I do, and it's literally something that you can get done in about under two hours. I mean, um, virtually all the work I'm doing is on camera. I'm virtually doing nothing off camera. Uh, let it soak for a little while, I do something else, and then I'm spraying lines. So realistically, the amount of times I clean and maintain my brush, I'm getting faster and faster at it. There's less faults, faults that reoccur, I can fix even sooner. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just so comfortable and so flexible with this airbrush now compared to like a year and a half ago when I started this series. I'm really glad that I've been uh, documenting this uh, process of um, trying to master and get better at this um, machine, this um, airbrush. And again, I highly recommend everybody watching at home, play along um, once a month, clean out your airbrush, pull it apart, pull it together, a little lube, a little cleaning, spray lines. Next month, I will show you how to do it without an ultrasonic cleaner. As long as you unclog the nozzle chamber every time you spray, uh, achieving lines like this is actually pretty easy. You know, I wasn't, I was just listening to the radio, jamming out, drinking some um, tea. So, yeah, too easy. That is um, all from spraying lines. We're going to get to the more experimental aspects of uh, the airbrush in this uh, video. And um, first, we're going to see if we can clean it out with some uh, acetone as per the Q&A this month. In this uh, segment we are going to be weathering decals. We can see that we've got some great shading and salt chipping but there is a decal right in the nose and it is uh, very clean, too clean. It doesn't look like it belongs. So I'm going to use a paintbrush and I'm going to put tiny tiny little um, paint chips on the decal and then I'm going to airbrush a tiny bit of um, orange on top, just a bit of um, a dust, and just change it. Looks like it's uh, going from a solid color to whatever the base color of the paint is. Now you can see that I have done not much. It's probably about four tiny uh, dabs, so they're the finest 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 um, dots uh, compare it to the end of a q-tip you can see that you don't actually have to do much I dry brushed it and I just tinyly dabbed it on and just probably a bit of a corner I put a big blob now I'm going to mix um, my orange paint but I'm going to mix it um, quite heavily it's going to literally only be 30-40% paint, the rest thinner, and I'm literally only going to put a drop of um, paint in it because I don't need to spray that much. So, when I meant I'm only applying the tiniest amount of paint, it's like whatever I can get off this and just putting in there. You can see it's just coating barely the bottom. And I'm only going to add a couple of drops. One, two, three. It 
Yeah, mix it nice and well. I'm going to keep the PSI nice and low. And you can see, I'm just barely dusting any on. And you see, we're just ever so changing the colour. And there you go. It looks like it kind of belongs. And if you want to do any more touch-ups here and there, you know, that is permissible, but... Yep, pretty happy with that. Now, I have to admit, with this weathering the decals, I was very nervous because um, I've done so much work on this kit, I didn't want to ruin anything, and there was really nothing to be worried about. Once I sprayed all the orange, I went to each decal and dusted on a tiny bit of orange as well as dabbed on the brown for spots. This one, I got the light blue, shaded it in and concentrated it in one corner, so the decal's shading, and then on that shaded bit, put a few more dots. So it's uh, at first it's not very noticeable, but when you zoom in, you can see the decal quite clearly, and it's uh, it's very well weathered. You can see faded um, rust chips as well as solid rust chips, and um, instead of just having a clean decal, it just blends in to the rest of this model. Same with this one; it's received uh, the chipping method, um, a tiny bit of orange, and then a tiny bit of light green applied on top of that. This decal has been rusted heavily so it's actually almost completely invisible. Uh, I'm actually very happy with this one. It just blends in perfectly. It's just not noticeable whatsoever unless you look really really close. You saw me spray this one. Uh, the weathering was only very light because I did more paint chipping so you can see breakages in the actual text and a bit of discoloring but this decal has survived a lot better than the other one so there's something more for the eye to be drawn to. Even though I've shown that one, I haven't shown that one. It received the orange, slight amount of green on the top and the bottom it's sort of uh, showing that the mud splats and rusting and all the brown is just creeping up on the decal from a solid colour to a light colour and you can still see the paint chips all over the place and from afar it's definitely something noticeable and when you go in you can see there's a decal. There is also a decal along um, the rust here. I left it solid. It could be like a bit of graffiti. You can see a really, really faded uh, decal band there. Um, just only shaded with a bit of green. And the same story with this one, just like the other one. No difference. So, again, just with a note. Uh, thin your paints heaps. You can see that I just put only a few drops. i done it something like two part thinner to one part paint. Very, very thin. Uh, you have to uh, lower the PSI under 10 and you have to pull back and just spray a tiny concentrated uh, dot where it actually takes a few seconds while moving around for build up. This way you don't just paint the decal immediately but it's just super, super, super subtle. Uh, probably uh, load up your airbrush with paint like that, lower the PSI and just practice on a clean um, bit of white paper and just watch it just slowly uh, colour in and you can see how you can do build ups of uh, colour and filters and colouring in and all sorts of fun things but yes more or less uh, this is how to weather decals, you can do it on a lot cleaner model and just put a tinge of uh, whatever the main base color of the model kit is over the decal and just make it look like that the decal is being placed on top of the color scheme and it's just slowly fading away and I think it just gives the model a ton of character it is a lot of work but it's just better than putting a clean decal on a dirty model now talking about dioramas I made two dioramas in the past month and I discovered with a Gunpla Builders World Cup entry a few years ago, the one with the uh, dom on the snow diorama base, that flock is transparent, and even though it looks good by itself, it's nothing without what's underneath it in the form of paint. 
and paint can really bring out an improved flock. And even though I bought some amazing flock for this diorama, it did take a bit of work. Uh, this part here, um, and uh, there is a picture in the work in progress uh, photos for this um, series of model which you will see. It uh, had it all green painted and I had patches of sand and this is a mixed color flock it's sort of a summer grass it's slightly dried out it's got a bit of sand color flakes it's got a bit of um, green flakes it's static grass the uh, hay bale was painted yellow and then there was yellow flock applied on top of that the fence was airbrushed uh, shades of uh, grey from dark to bright and the road was a series of dark browns. It was way too dark and instead of uh, hand painting, dry brushing or further airbrushing I used MIG pigments and just placed um, some medium brands around there, just a few different colours including rusts, put a fixative on it, waited it to dry and then put some really white uh, sand colours and white at the very tip and then affixated that on and it looks alright uh, the edges was airbrushed um, black instead of hand painted and it gave a nice little feathering effect around the edge uh, everything was hit with um, a sludge wash and a few coats of uh, matte clear I am extremely happy with this finish same story with this diorama underneath the flock was green and flock was applied same with under there the soil effect was different type of brown some not even compatible from a very black dark brown building up to white and they were just done in uh, shades so I shaded on black and then overlapping the black was a super dark brown and it just kept going up until I got to the really light stuff when I got really light I would occasionally pull back in dust to blend it all together same with the stonework, no different except it was compatible greys. Uh, the corner here was all black and went out from a dark grey to a lighter grey and building up gradients to the top, which looked very obvious. Once the sludge wash of black was applied, it broke it up into various bricks and it looks alright. Now the trees, people spend a lot of money on modeling, model trees. I actually bought these very cheap, about three, four bucks a piece, but they're very boring as is. They're just a solid one color. I was actually reading in a fine scale hobby magazine that when you're scratch building or applying trees, if you look at trees in real life, which actually there are some outside my window right now. Uh, due to how the light hits them and the shadowing and the different type of trees, no two trees are the same color. There's mixes of greens, yellows and sometimes oranges. And what you want to do is uh, slightly dust uh, main different colors on different trees and then at the very bottom um, shade a little black, dark green and work your way to the top where it will be a light green or white but the base color of each tree and maybe a bit of further post shading can be different colors browns oranges yellows go wild i did a tad of research and know your trees and what colors they are i know these are pine trees and pine trees like christmas trees they all almost look the same these two are slightly different shades of color but it just gives it a tiny bit of definition i went to all this trouble of shading my base shading my model kit shading everything and then you're going to have these monotone trees the flock and the trees can take the paint and when you're done painting the tree spray a bit of um, hairspray on it and it sort of just affixes the paint on it affixes the flock to wherever the flock needs to be it makes it a lot harder it's not going to molt flock all over the place for about 10,000 years and you're going to have green shit in your car for about a manelia where you sell it second hand to some guy and you'll be thinking what the hell weird stuff was this individual into uh, yeah, that's a real tantrum. All in all, painting trees is good fun. And don't forget, if there's any exposed branches, that needs a bit of love. Might be a bit hard with an airbrush, but a paintbrush is also good. I've got some acetone. We're going to see if we can clean out this uh, airbrush. I've been using Plamo Colour. Uh, this mob in the UK was making them. Um, they were pretty inconsistent and kind of thin. The pigment density was light. Not a fan of it. Um, 
disappointed. I spent a lot of money on it. But at least I've got $200 worth of paint to do experiments, which um, I'd rather not have spent that much money. Besides uh, bitching and carrying on about Plamo color, I've uh, emptied the airbrush. And with the dry uh, tissue, I'm going to clean out the chamber. And normally, we do the same thing with uh, lacquer thinner. Except, uh, we're going to do an um, experiment with acetone. Now, acetone is a chemical that you actually naturally build up in your body. And it's a lot less harmful to breathe in and to touch than um, lacquer thinner. And it seems to consistently thin um, the paint quite nicely. And it seemed to clean it out just as effectively as uh, lacquer thinner. So the chamber's pretty clean. I'm going to spray a bit more. Do the bubble jet technique. Empty the contents into my waste jar. And it's cleaned it out quite nicely. So for now, acetone is excellent at uh, cleaning out lacquer paint and I assume other types of paints like your acrylics and whatnot from your airbrush. What I might do next month is I will thin lacquer paint with uh, acetone and see um, what it does if it uh, airbrushes just as nicely and if that is the case um, and it airbrushes uh, very nicely uh, I will officially swap from lacquer thinner to acetone as my official um, uh, airbrush thinner uh, the only issue that I might have is acetone evaporates faster than lacquer thinner but there's probably ways around it and I have uh, come across a chemical factory where I could buy acetone in very large quantities cheap uh, though this 500ml was um, a little over ten dollars and uh, half a litre would be uh, tons to thin and clean your airbrush paint compared to buying um, Mr Hobby or Guy Note brand or Tamir brand uh, lacquer thinner so, uh, yep, yeah, stay tuned, and we will try that out next month. Now, watching the Ghost of Xeon on YouTube, uh, Scott's a good friend of mine, he has been painting for over the past year uh, nail polish on his model kits. And nail polishes go in and out of fashion, and uh, there's just so many colours and effects and gradients on the market. They're constantly coming and going, and they might never even come back again. Um, I was uh, given this, this is just a cheapie, um, as a gift, and I'm going to experiment on camera um, airbrushing a spoon, and after um, I do this experiment this month, I'm actually going to paint one or two uh, model kits with... Um, yeah, nail polish. So I'm going to give it a good shake, uh, a good stir, uh, pour some into uh, the airbrush, thin it 50-50, and we'll see how uh, nicely it applies. Okay, so 50-50 mix, spoon, let's do this. The pigment density is extremely low. It's coming out quite thin. Even though it does come in 13mm, a bit more than your standard 10mm um, paint jar, about approximately the same price, it's going to take a few more coats. So you do have to be mindful of your um, undercoats. Uh, this is a fairly solid colour, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, two coats, pretty solid, um, can't complain, 
third coat. And my thing is already out of paint. Just as an experiment, I've got a solid blue here, so I'm going to paint a few lines and see how transparent it is. It's had several passes, and it's still fairly transparent. You know what? That is actually a pretty cool effect. I like it and I can keep building up coats and um, I could definitely do some cool things I wouldn't buy it at uh, its retail price though I would uh, definitely um, stock up on it when they're at chemists or whatever really really cheap I'm gonna put a few more coats on the spoon and we'll have a look at it in under a light atmosphere probably about eight coats or so now it's not a solid uh, pink, I accidentally mixed it with a bit of blue from the stirrer, so clean stirrers. Uh, it is a bit tr transparent, um, I reckon because uh, being nail polished there's some weird blemishes on it. It feels thinned with acetone because I hear um, when women paint their nails and airbrush their nails they do it with acetone rather than lacquer thinner. Uh, that would probably improve the finish immensely because it's uh, what's appropriate. So that would be used uh, next time. And I'm going to be a lot more patient in its coats. I did was a little bit um, impatient. Uh, most of it is either high gloss or metallics. So I reckon an undercoat of uh, just normal um, Gaia Note or Mr. Hobby Silver. Nothing premium like Outcloud or whatever as an undercoat and you just dust it on lightly or heavily uh, whatever you want um, if you want to go dark gloss black all in all uh, as per Ghost of Zion's video which I highly recommend watching I'll link down below uh, this was a grand success um, it was very easy to paint uh, this one gave me a tad of trouble because it's probably an El Cheapo I hear uh, other brands out there which I'll experiment with multiple brands before I do a proper video on it um, is a lot easier than lacquer paints and acrylics and all that but uh, in the scheme of things this is a five dollar bottle and I've only used about that much for one spoon so getting a whole high grade out of it one bottle definitely master grade you probably want to go buy uh, two bottles a few clear coats uh, a bit of um, a buff job and that would be uh, one sexy finish and I just realized I forgot to actually stir it, so I probably only sprayed the top layer, which was probably a bit silly, but we will um, do that next time. That's probably why the pigments were a bit light. And that concludes my honing your airbrush skills video for this month. Um, just a recap, as always, uh, practice, use your airbrush, pull your airbrush apart as many times as you humanly can. Uh, this series is not a tutorial and uh, we've done quite a bit uh, refreshing on um, everything that we've learnt in the past we can see with the lines that I've uh, painted um, things are going extremely well I'm extremely happy with the direction of the series how far my airbrushing has uh, gone it's uh, been very uh, transparent and evident throughout my whole channel and I'm just having a lot of fun making this series I mean I started uh, this week thinking, you know, I have to make another um, video, they're about half an hour, how I'm going to find the content, and um, I had no plans, nothing written down besides thinking, yeah, time for another recap, probably want to play with um, the nail polish, uh, and that's about it. Everything's just rolled out of memory, and what I have done. So, next month, what I want to hopefully do is demonstrate cleaning an airbrush without an ultrasonic cleaner, and uh, pr probably still use it at the end to show what would be left inside. Uh, item number two, I would like to uh, do a little airbrushing with um, acetone in lacquer paint. And we will probably try painting another spoon with a different brand of um, nail polish. And see how that's a bit different because I'm not 100% satisfied with uh, one. Experiment. When I turned the camera off after showing it off, it was a 
had patchy and um, it wasn't that vibrant it sort of had these tiny speckles to show that it's sort of slightly orange peeled and it wasn't perfect perfect um, not from what Scott at Ghost to Zion told me so what I've done is and if you've ever got an undesirable effect using lacquers if it's orange peeled a bit or if it's a bit patchy or it's not up to your expectation I just brushed about three coats of lacquer thinner straight onto the paint and knowing if you add lacquer thinner straight to perfectly dried lacquer paint it returns it back into paint um, if you spray a little bit, it turns back into the putty semi-curing stage that uh, paint drying goes. So I coated it, turned it back to putty, it sort of melted on the surface, became absolutely flat and um, vibrant like uh, enamels. When you hand paint enamels, uh, it takes ages to dry and cure and if you leave any brush strokes because it takes so many hours to days to cure the brush strokes sort of just um, sag and uh, just cover the surface and flattens itself and this is the exact same thing um, a lot of those um, patchiness a lot of those uh, grains they just became perfectly smooth I remember a tutorial ages ago someone recommending that when hand painting with lacquers you just slap it on how rough and crappy you desire it doesn't matter if there's brush strokes and whatever and then you just uh, brush on a heap of um, lacquer thinner after it dries and it will uh, just level itself out but um, yeah that worked out might even demonstrate it in a future video and uh, all in all that's the conclusion. Thank you very much for watching. As always, until next time, if there's anything you guys want to have, uh, be demonstrated or shown or got any suggestions, uh, throw them in. I'm happy to give them a go. This is a big open lab experimentation thing. Um, I'm most happy to do anything. I'm happy to people to uh, make videos very similar to this and there could be some sort of interaction backwards and forwards, what works, what doesn't work. You know, make something of it, I suppose. Also, in a future video where I'm getting in these uh, bootleg uh, Sparmax airbrushes from China, I've got one on order. I'm going to order a few more to uh, use. I would like to actually do a full review showcase demonstration airbrush with one freshly bought what's available right now on eBay, not what was from a few years ago because, you know, they change from factory batch to factory batch. But I want to demonstrate that you do spend all your money on your compressor, but your airbrush, uh, as long as you're buying the right one, not those uh, single action plastic really garbage rubbishy ones, but a solid metal proper replica um, double action airbrush. Uh, they are slightly rough, but with a little tuning, a little demonstration, I'll show you how to make it work just like a $200 airbrush. Catch you guys later and uh, have a good one. Cheers.